USA. Hi there, come on in. If you're a pheasant hunter and you've wondered if those ring necks are gonna ever come back, you're gonna be interested in our first feature. We're gonna show you how the state of Michigan is preconditioning a Chinese strain of pheasants before they're released by putting owls and foxes into the rearing pens. We'll show you how to catch crappies in the spring. Kathy Beitler has a super grilled salmon steak recipe. Bob Garner comments on contributing to organizations that are anti-hunting, but sportsmen don't know it. All this coming up in just a moment, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's time for the Outdoor Digest. Pheasant hunting used to be the number one attraction of small game hunters in the Midwestern states, but pheasant populations have slid drastically since the 1950s. Opening days have attracted less and less hunters, and the number of pheasants taken in many states is a fraction of what it was 25 years ago. Closing pheasant season doesn't do any good because hunters only harvest the roosters, and that doesn't affect reproduction of the rest of the flock. Restocking doesn't help much either. The boldest experiment is being done in Michigan, where the DNR imported black neck pheasants from China and have been releasing them in what used to be prime ring neck territory. The big problem was that only 50% of the released birds survived their first four weeks in the wild. Most were eaten by predators. So wildlife biologists got the idea to put foxes and owls in the pheasant pens to precondition the birds for better survival. When a bird is reared in the pen, it's got a couple of things going against it. First, it's, it's never raised with a group of adult birds, so that it has the chance to develop normal, normal wild bird behavior. And secondly, they're fenced in and they're protected from predators. Mm -hmm. So again, that whole component of learning that they would get in the wild is missing. And so all we're trying to do is put a little of that back into the system in, in a very controlled sense so that the birds we release in the spring are, are more wary of predators, that are aware that that's something they should, they should be alert and, and watching and avoid if possible. We tried leaving the fox in this pen overnight, and the, and the fox killed 30 birds. Hmm. So that was not desirable from our standpoint, and I wanted to narrow that time down, and my choices were basically to work late in the evening or early in the morning. If I worked late in the evening, as it gets darker, it becomes harder to get the animal back out of the pen when we want to stop the, the experiment. Mm -hmm. So we chose to work in the early morning. Uh, we see fairly normal hunting behavior on the part of the uh, fox, and at, the sun is rising, it's getting brighter. That all helps us in terms of getting the animal back out again. What we saw when the fox went down the, the row between the pens is the birds in the pen the fox was in scattered. They were nervous. The birds on the other side of the fence we're sticking their nose through like a bunch of spectators watching a construction project. They learn very quickly when they're in danger and when they're not. You know, and the fox, the fox had to learn in the beginning not to hunt birds on the other side of the fence, that, that she wasn't going to be able to, to successfully um, mm. kill one of those birds. So the fox learned to hunt in her pen, and I think the pheasants learn when they're in danger and when they're not. So if we showed the movies, the fox is taking pheasants, it wouldn't phase them. you got to put the fox after that, right on that I pheasant. I think it needs to be reinforced, right. Huh. Well, that's interesting. That the, And there did appear to be some pheasants in the pen that were much more afraid of the fox than other pheasants. Some would flush quite a distance. Right, right. We do see, particularly roosters, show a wide variation of behavior. And you will see some roosters, uh, when the fox has made a kill, and is struggling to, to finish that bird or, or to take it and, and put it away under a little corner somewhere, that there are some, some roosters that will actually approach the scene and try to, to get a better look. Hmm. But not the hens. Uh, I don't see as much of that with the hens, no. Coming right back. Oh, oh, got her. Right here. Good what job, a shot. Here you go, Pete. That was quick thinking. Boy, that fox is rising up. Yes, Charlie, can you grab this handle? What about the owls that you've released in here? Well, the owls were hard to work with in the beginning, just like the fox. Uh, part of the difficulty came in, in getting the animal to hunt in a pen situation. Uh, but we've, we've had two owls now that we've trained to hunt in the pens, and they, they are very successful. 
But a lot of birds, pheasants don't like hawks and owls either. I heard some scuttlebutt that some of the roosters beat up on some of the early owls. Is that <laughs> We used a couple of pet owls in the beginning, and um, those birds just didn't seem very wild. They didn't show any normal hunting behavior. Uh, they wouldn't use the perches in the pen. They hopped along on the ground, and most there we had one owl that the rooster ran right over the top of. Hmm. So the, getting the right animal is real important. Mm -hmm. But the owl we're working with now is... is uh, probably by human standards, nasty. Uh, but she does a good job in the pen. Uh, we leave her in overnight, and uh, she generally kills one or two birds when she's in the pen. Uh, the big test for us is when our, our Sichuan birds go out this spring, we will be putting radios on the birds, um, and half of them will be birds that come from the pen where the predator has been worked, and half of them will come from a pen where there has been no work with a predator. And we will be looking at differences in survival uh, between the two groups. Researchers have found that wild birds of all kinds, not just pheasants, but turkey and grouse as well, have terribly high mortality rates when they're turned loose with radio packs strapped to their backs. Some birds have even starved to death, apparently because of the stress. So the success of this preconditioning experiment has been difficult to measure. But biologists say they have a gut feeling that the preconditioned birds not wearing radios do have a higher survival rate. Wildlife research biologist Mary Rabe has been in charge of this novel predator experiment, which until now, nobody even thought of. There were no blueprints, and developing the methods has definitely not been easy. No, it certainly hasn't. We're, we're working from scratch on this program. We haven't had a lot to go on. We're developing it as we go. Uh, it may be something that we want to work with another two or three years. Uh, it has a lot of practical application for all people that are raising birds and releasing um, in game management programs, but also for endangered species programs, where you're trying to bring birds back and then reintroduce them into the wild. So we really see a lot of application for the program. Maybe there is hope for the return of pheasants in good, huntable numbers. If these experiments work, both the Sichuan pheasant introduction and the fox in the hen house experiment could have significant impact on wildlife restoration around the country. This is the ringneck pheasant that was once the king of game birds across the country. Now there's still strong populations in oh, Nebraska, Iowa, basically the Corn Belt, that part of the Midwest, but the eastern states, well, the population has been dropping. Maybe this bird will be replaced in a few years with the blackneck pheasant. Who knows? But right now, let's take a look at some of the big fish and big game we have in our trophy book. <laughs> Jason Wagner was fishing with a jigging Rapala and a minnow and caught this 10-pound, 10 10-ounce 10 walleye. And what a big carp young Ben Wiling speared it was 28 and a half pounds. This big 6-pound, 2-ounce bass fell to the black plastic worm Diane Shornack was using. I caught this 2-pound, 1-ounce, 15 and a half inch white bass on a walleye magnet last year fishing with taxidermist Keith Lutz. And here's Unibel Weaver with her nine and a quarter inch bearded gobbler she took with her muzzle loader. Gerald March tagged this 10 pointer the second day of the season. Fred Parent's 11 pointer weighed 176 pounds. He took it with a shotgun. And here's a 583 pound eight by eight bull elk taken by Steve Grassman after he stalked it. There was some hardwoods and I walked across the hardwoods until I got a good clean shot at him, about 150 yard shot. And uh, he went down right there and got back up, and he ran about, oh, 50 yards, took down some big trees, some saplings and stuff, and that was it. He died right there. That was it. 16-point bull, as many points as they get, and I think that's an imperial bull. Well, it was a bull of a lifetime and plenty big enough to make Steve Grassman our Outdoor Digest Trophy Elk Hunter of the Week. 
A California policeman's group called Peace Officers Against Gun Control has kicked off its campaign to block anti-gun laws and ordinances. San Jose officer Leroy Pyle says he believes that laws to lock up rapists, killers, and gang members for long periods of time would make the public much safer. Americans are spending three times as many days trying to catch fish as they did just 30 years ago, according to a national survey. That adds up to 172 million days a year that Americans put up the gone fishing sign. Just a couple of days ago, I received a phone call from a gentleman who was quite irritated with some anti-hunting and trapping literature his seven-year-old brought home from school. It came from a local humane society and was written in what the gentleman called a deliberate attempt to influence youngsters to believe that hunting and trapping were bad, cruel, and inhumane. Now, he'll be taking this issue up with the school board in his town to make sure the schools don't distribute this propaganda again. But there's a more important lesson here, and that is that not every humane society spends every dollar donated to it to protect, shelter, and neuter dogs and cats. Some of them spend the money to try and end our right to hunt. Now, I've often warned hunters that before they donate to a humane society, they ought to check it out and make sure it isn't anti-hunting. There are many good societies that spend virtually every nickel on cats and dogs and they do a wonderful job. And it's those humane societies that do the most public good and deserve our support. How would a small vial of gasoline or kerosene help a sportsman battle a tick bite? Trying to pull a tick off your skin can result in the tick's toothy beak breaking off and causing a festering sore. Putting a drop of gasoline or kerosene on a tick will cause it to loosen its grip so it can be safely removed. For Judith LeBriar from Minden, Louisiana, and for some 300 other young sharpshooters from 40 states, Canada, Mexico, and from as far away as Great Britain, practice paid off. These young shooters competed in the 23rd annual DAISY USJC's International BB Gun Championships held in 1988 at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And even though the competition is limited to youngsters, this event has become the third largest organized shooting competition in the world. The program now involves over 250,000 youngsters each year that go through this shooting education program. And it's a 10-hour course conducted by local JC chapters. Shooting takes place on a 5-meter range. Top scores require pinpoint accuracy. We practice 6.30 to 8 o'clock at night, um, every, every night um, during the weekdays, and sometimes on Sundays. I'm from Myerstown, Pennsylvania, and I've been shooting for three years and I like coming out to the internationals because you get to meet a lot of new people and this is the best I've, that I've done at the internationals. I'm 12 years old and I've been shooting for two years and I enjoy it because it's a lot of fun and it teaches you gun safety, which really needs to be learned. I'm from Great Britain and I've been shooting for just under two years now and I enjoy shooting because it's, it's just a wonderful sport. For information on how to qualify for the 1989 Internationals, contact your local JC Chapter or DAISY or the National Shooting Sports Foundation at area code 203-762-1320. In the northern part of the United States, crappies, black crappie and white crappie, Ah, they're, they're fairly small compared to those southern crappies that grow so big, but the principles of catching crappie are all basically the same. So let's take a look at a story in the springtime right now on how you can catch crappies wherever you live. One beauty of fishing for panfish in the spring when they're spawning is that you can fish from shore. But when you're going after crappie, a small boat is a big help because crappie are one type of panfish that don't hug the shorelines. Wayne Magdalena is a tournament bass fisherman, and a good one at that. 
but he also likes to get fish for the fryer. And in the spring, he enjoys catching crappie because they're fun to catch on light tackle. The lake we're fishing is a small one. It has public access, and although it might not contain a lot of big trophy fish, it does hold a lot of good eating size fish. Lots of lakes like this one that you can find probably near your area. The important thing for crappies is to find what Al Lindner calls confined open water. That generally means a drop-off next to an expanse of open water. Crappies like to hang next to it. A graph or depth finder is helpful in locating the drop-offs along deeper, more open water. And we're going to start by fishing out in front of an outlet from the lake. Now we're right by the mouth. This should start. The water's getting darker here. A lake map shows us where the drop-offs are. Drop-off should be suspended right off the drop-off near some weed beds or brush. There's no brush in this lake, so it'll probably be near weed beds. Yeah, where are we, where are we at here? We're coming right off here on that drop-off. This is an indentation that comes in towards the shore. It's showing on this map here. And what we're doing is running the edge of this indentation, trying to find a weed bed or a school of crappies, either one. Okay, there's leveling off, leveling off right now. Should be leveling off at about 18 or 20 feet. And it should be starting to come up in about, oh, about 50 feet ahead of the boat here. Yeah, there it's coming up. Bottom's coming up right there, rapidly. This, this should be an excellent spot to try. I think we should uh, maybe... Oh, we're coming right up to with three feet of water. We came right out of the drop-off. There's, Like I said, that's the like... The graph showed us the steep banks crappie like to school next to. That's where we'll fish. Starting with a small hook, about number six, up a foot or so, a split-shot sinker, which holds the bait down as well as stops the slip bobber when you cast. When you're fishing deep, 12 feet right here, the only way you can cast a bobber is if it slips. 12 feet up, I tied a rubber band, which is where the bobber will stop and the line underneath will drop down 12 feet. What's the classic crappie bait? Minnows. Small minnows are often called crappie minnows or perch minnows. One problem I always have is hanging on to these slippery little things. The minnows are small, the hooks are small, so don't feel bad if you have a little difficulty. That's just a part of crappie fishing with live bait. Once under the dorsal fin is a common way of hooking it, and on the back cast, the bobber slips down to the split shot, but after the bobber lands on the water, the line will peel down through the hole in the bobber until it hits the rubber band knot. So I'm still fishing 12 feet down along a drop off while Wayne Magdalena is casting a small jig. His first crappie came immediately. First cast. So even though we didn't mark any school of crappie on the graph, we did find the habitat they like. They were there and apparently hungry. Look at that. On the classic jig. There are two common species of crappie, the white crappie and the black crappie. Because they look so much alike, in our fishing awards program, we lump both under crappie. Minimum weight for an award is one and three quarter pounds or 13 inches in length. Today, our largest would be 11 inches and weigh 11 ounces. Live basket's an excellent way to keep panfish fresh. Since Wayne got action on the jig and my bobber method wasn't producing right away, I switched to a jig. I'm using four pound test line. Wayne is using two pound test, which can make a difference. I'll put a minnow on this jig. Wayne was using a plastic twister tail, but we'll see how this works. Action looks good. And you'd think the smell of a real minnow would be even more appealing to the crappie than the fake plastic tail Wayne was trying to con them with. Sometimes jigging like this, giving little jerks as you retrieve it, that seems to work best. But on this day, a slow, steady retrieve was the ticket. Several times, Wayne and I connected I for a double. Oh, I do. I got one on, too. <laughs> We've located him now. Well, this feels like a pretty good one. I'm somewhat impressed. Yeah, we got him here. Well, look at that. Lost my minnow on it, but what the heck? A double. So we've hit the school. One of the nice things about crappie, well, all panfish actually, is that they travel in schools. Where you find one, you find lots more. Into the basket they go, fish number two and three. One isn't quite large enough to make a meal, but six or eight fillets from crappie this size make an ample serving. Ooh, that's the biggest one yet. 
That's a great one. Well, now that's a dandy. I'd like to get a bunch of those. One thing to keep in mind with crappie, their mouths are relatively fragile. They're not tough and durable like other fish. With bigger ones, you might want to use a net because the hook can pull out easily. Wayne was out casting me about three to one. Was it the thread-like two-pound test line he was using, or was it his twister tail jig rather than a minnow? Now, I couldn't change line, but I could change to a twister tail, which is what I did. The white tail with a pink head is a classic, a big crappie producer, and it does work better with light line, but here's the key to catching crappie. See the sandbar? It drops off steeply next to open water, and crappies like to school up next to this drop-off. A dead tree in deep water is ideal, too. Crappies hide there waiting for schools of minnows to come by. Doesn't take a lot of equipment or expensive gear to catch crappies in the spring. A graph or depth finder is helpful, but not necessary. You can spot drop-offs with your eye. You can test the depths with your line or anchor rope. That's crappie, the calico scrapper, also called specks in some parts of the country, pronounced crappie or crappy. If you can find one, you can usually catch a mess, which is one reason why crappie are so popular among anglers throughout North America. Well, I know what the southern boys are saying right now. They're saying, did you see the little teeny crappie they caught? Well, up north, where we tape that, the crappie do run a little bit smaller. But if you want to catch those big southern crappie, you might be able to cut them into steaks, and they'll work great in our recipe. Don and Leslie Gooch have sent us an excellent recipe for grilled and seasoned mm. salmon steaks. You know, it sounds good, although steaks are not my favorite, because they have the skin on them, the, the lateral line, and they have fat on them. It, but, that's true, but for this recipe, it, the skin will make it hold together just a little bit better, and I think that they do stay better that way. Now, what was all that, those ingredients for? That's going to make a sauce, an excellent sauce. It's got mayonnaise and parsley. Now, we do use fresh parsley here, and you could use the dried, but the fresh really does make a difference in this. So why'd you use the dried chives? Because <sighs> they're a little bit harder to find this time of year. Oh, I see. And lemon juice. And, of course, fake lemon juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want dried. You, you <laughs> get then, credit only for the fresh parsley that's and right. the fresh salmon. That's right. No, that's, that's good. There's a fresh uh, clove of garlic. very fresh. And then your salt and pepper. And you can make just a good sauce out of that, and then that goes right on the steaks. And you want your grill good and hot, because if it's not, the fish will stick to the grill, and you don't want it to stick. No, so th that looks like tartar sauce. Oh, it's better oh, you than... you spread it on the top than, side. Right, the it, top side. as the bottom side is cooking. And then you flip it and then put more on the other side, oh, the, the you cooked know, side. The, the saving grace of these steaks is that, that the fat drips down through. Absolutely. And it's good to have it real hot, too. Oh, man. Who can <laughs> turn that? I bet Bob Garner will go bonkers over this. This is the way to cook salmon. Mm -hmm. This is the way to cook salmon. These Salmon is, is kind of a meaty sort of fish anyway. And this... Well, there is, you know, it doesn't taste fishy. It's it's just just very very good meat, like Amazing the finest meat. seafood. Mm -hmm. How I it was, didn't dry out. I was skeptical about steaks because so often steaks are greasy. They got the skin on them and all that well, lateral I think that's when line. Well, they're baked, you know, and it stays mm. right in there. But this actually dripped down into the grill. That's it. And plus, there's mm -hmm. a secret. That's there, why I haven't really cared for steaks mm -hmm. that are baked like that. There's huh? an absolute secret to this too, and all the fine seafood restaurants do this. They don't overcook the mm -hmm. fish. Mmm. -hmm. Ten okay. to one, if I cooked it, it would have been overcooked, <laughs> but Kath did a perfect job. A perfect job? On, just, oh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Great recipe. This recipe for grilled salmon steaks is absolutely outstanding. It would also work well with trout. The step-by-step -step instructions are in the May-June issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine. This new issue announces some big changes in our outdoors club. In the past month, we've restructured the educational functions. We've set up a Sportsman's Outdoor Service SOS Bureau to investigate consumer complaints about outdoors products and services that cost over $100. The Outdoor Digest magazine now features video capture frames directly from our TV show. Well, that wraps up another edition of Outdoor Digest. We're still left wondering just what the future is of the ringneck pheasant around the country and, of course, the blackneck pheasant experiment that's taking place in Michigan. We're going to take our cameras this fall to one of those hot Midwestern states, Nebraska, Iowa, the Dakotas, one of those places to find out 
what makes that pheasant hunting so good and why it's kept up all these years. But whatever you do this weekend, if you go crappie fishing or just get outdoors, please do. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Coming up next week on Outdoor Digest, we'll have fun with recreational shooting. Not the misuse of guns you're used to seeing every night on TV, but safe and enjoyable target shooting. Guns can be used responsibly, and shooting can be a wholesome recreational pursuit. We'll also go fishing for white bass. Lots of action. Kathy Beitler's recipe next week is for salmon rice loaf. It's good. Bob Garner will have his outdoor headlines and commentary, plus our other regular features. So join us for Outdoor Digest. Same time, same place next week right here on Public Television.